Ephesians chapter 6. We'll look at something we've looked at before. Ephesians chapter 6. Out of respect for the word of God, would you please stand? Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. The word of God, let us hear it together. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. Thank you for standing. Please be seated. Let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you again for the beauty of your word and the loveliness of your son and the sweet gift of your spirit. And now, O our God, we ask that you would help us. Give us the tongue of the learned, the mind of Christ, Lord, the power of your spirit, and help us to speak. For thus saith the Lord, hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, I have a throat problem. Ephesus was a wealthy city that that revolved, if I can say revolved around the life, I shouldn't say life because it's not alive, of the temple of Artemis or Diana, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Paul find himself or found himself in the midst of pagan darkness. We find that in Acts chapter 19. He would labor in that city for two years, for two years, so that all, both Jews and Greek, heard the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. The message was so effective that sins were confessed. Repentance was worked in the heart. Many believed, and the name of Jesus Christ was magnified. People were being delivered from idolatry. People were turning from worshiping Artemis or Diana to worshiping Jesus Christ. Knowing, Paul knowing that the church of Ephesus now was in a particular situation, a peculiar situation, strategically placed there by God. Knowing that God had planted that candlestick to shine in the midst of pagan darkness, Paul is encouraging this church at Ephesus not only to shine, but to stand. Paul gave three chapters of instructions 
of what God has accomplished for them and us in Jesus Christ. Just listen to some of them. He had chosen them on and us before the foundation of the world and adopted us into God's royal family. Put a different way. We've been adopted into the royal family, purchased by royal blood, by the royal Savior, so that we would be royalty. It would be beautiful if we treated one another that way. That's verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1. We are also accepted in the beloved. Verse 6, <laughs> do we actually understand what that means? Accepted in the beloved. That is, we are highly favor favored. We have become recipients of God's kindness. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, forgiven of our sins, and given the gift of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that these things are ours. What a God. We have been raised from the dead and rescued from the power of darkness. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. He has raised us, made us, and placed us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 6. He has given us the gift of faith so that we would not only believe but do good works. Chapter 2, verse 10. He has brought us nigh through the blood of his cross. 2.13, we have been reconciled to God, 2.16. We have been made fellow heirs and are privileged to have all of these gospel promises in Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, verse 16. Over oh, 6. What is he getting at? We have a victorious Savior who has been given headship over the church and has a name far above all principalities, powers, and might. And every name, that is name. We now have full access to the Father through the Son by the Spirit, because we are no more strangers but children of the living God. These things and more are set out before us in the first three chapters, listen carefully, as our motivation for unity and purity in the family of God. Without these accomplishments by our God, we will not be able to stand. Let me see if I can put it this way. Chapters 1 through 3 tell us the source of our belief, and chapters 4 through 6 gives us the significance of our behavior. Chapters 1 through 3, here is the source of our belief. God has done something, and we have done absolutely nothing except sin. And because God has done something, chapters 1 through 3, we can now do something, chapters 4 through 6. Our belief system, I've said it several times, I'm going to say it again tonight. Our belief system shapes our behavior system. You can't have one without the other. What you believe, regardless of what you say, that's how you will live. And you won't live any differently. Our behavior reflects what we really believe. So, we come to an interesting portion. Because I think it's important. The saints' greatest weapon, prayer. The saints, we can even say the church, 
The saint's greatest weapon is prayer. I just taken us from actually in verse 18. <clears throat> Paul commanded the church at Ephesus to put on not part, not half, not a quarter, but the whole armor of God, because you will need every bit of it. The whole armor of God so that we would be able to stand against the schemes, the craftiness, the shistiness of the enemy. What I love about this chapter is that Paul doesn't leave us guessing who the enemy is. He actually identifies the enemy. This battle with the enemy is intense. You do believe that, don't you? It's an intense battle. Satan isn't playing any games. We may be playing games, but he's playing none. He is serious. He's been at this a long time. He knows what to do and when to do it. Paul is encouraging the church, you better hold your ground. As a body and as a family, if we could say it this way, like we used to say in Carolina, you better tighten up. Tighten up your belt, wearing the truth. Put on your, breast, your breastplate this behavior of righteousness and stand firm in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, Paul is encouraging them, you need to stand firm with the shield of confidence in God in the face of opposition. We are called to take upon the helmet of salvation and protect our minds, because that's what the enemy is aiming for. If Satan gets the mind, he has the person. Because your mind and your life are married together for life. How we think is how we will live. You have to stand firm. Stand firm with the word of God, the sword of the spirit. And now, after saying all of that, Paul says, I got another weapon for you. You desperately need it. And it's the greatest weapon you have. And I think we use it very little. He said, it's prayer. That's your weapon. <clears throat> the saint's greatest weapon is prayer. If we are going to stand firm as a congregation, if we are going to be successful in battle, we better be a praying church or it's not going to happen. Satan knows how to pull a pin on a hand grenade, throw it out, leave, and watch everything explode. The saints then, number one, need to be praying all the time. All the time. What is prayer? Can I give a a, just a simple definition? Prayer is living people, living people pouring out their hearts to the living God. The simple, as simple as I can make it. Prayer is living people pouring out their hearts to the living God. Prayer is the communication channel that Jesus Christ has opened up for us to the Father. We have to make use of it. Paul writes this, For through him, that's Jesus, we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access by one spirit unto the Father. Don't miss it. 
It's Trinitarian in its, in its language. Paul said, we through him, Jesus Christ, have access to the Father by the Spirit. We come through the Son by the Spirit to the Father. A prayer is the means by which we draw strength from our God. And guess what? If we are going to stand against the kingdom of darkness, if we are going to battle, we will need all the strength that we can get. We need everything that heaven can afford us. But we need to pray for it. Are you still with me? We need to pray for it. Prayer is simple. Remember, living people pouring out their hearts to the living God. You're just putting words, if I can say it that way, in God's ears. It's simple, yet difficult. The simplest thing to do is talk, if I can say it that way, and yet it's difficult. But what, what, what I mean, prayer is moving our words into the ears of the one who can move the world. It's another way for me to put it. Prayer, simple yet difficult because prayer requires undivided attention and concentration, and that's hard. That's hard when we are in a world calling for our minds all the time. Isn't it amazing? Let's be honest. Isn't it amazing that we can sit around and we can talk about things sometimes? I don't know, maybe, maybe sports or whatever you like to do, maybe drawing or whatever it is. We can sit around and talk about some things a long time, sometimes hours. But when we get before God, we run out of words. Five minutes seem just too long. It's absolutely amazing. We get a loss for words. You know why sometimes that is? Because prayer is a spiritual matter. It's a battleground. It's war zone. Satan, on one hand, doesn't mind if we pray as long as we don't believe as we're praying. He doesn't mind you praying if you're not expecting anything from God. Doesn't mind you praying at all. Just like he doesn't mind we reading the scriptures, as long as you don't do it. Doesn't mind. It's spiritual. It's a spiritual battle. We have to fight through stuff in our minds. Sometimes. After praying, we wondered if we have prayed at all. There are so many ways to get off track in prayer. It's like driving on Interstate 10. There's so many exits to get off. Paul understands that it's simple and difficult. He understands that if we are going to have success, if we are going to have success standing against the wicked one, standing in this world, we better be a praying people. For some reason, I'm going to say this, we just can't wait <laughs> to presidential election and say, hey, hey, y'all, we, we really need to pray <laughs> when election's coming around. Well, when should we pray? Paul says, praying with all prayer and supplication, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. In other words, praying always. Paul said we need to be doing it all the time. All the time. This is essentially pray without ceasing. Having that mindset of prayer, having our minds conditioned for prayer, we are encouraged to pray in every 
every single situation. Every single, I said it Sunday, I'll say it again. Guess what we do when we have our problems? We run to other folks first. We go to shade tree mechanics instead of to God, the great manufacturer. And I said, don't go to other people. That's not what I'm implying, but that's usually where we go first. Instead of to God who knows all about our situation. We need to pray in every situation. We need to be praying every moment we get. I mean, we have to ask the question, do we pray? <laughs> we have to ask that question. I'm talking to myself as well. Do we actually pray? I'm just not talking about when we're getting ready to eat lunch, breakfast, and dinner. Those are fine times to pray, but do we actually pray? I didn't ask if you knew how to pray. I didn't ask anything like that. I didn't ask if you read about prayers. That's not what I asked. I asked, do you pray? That's my question. The way things look around us, <laughs> the way things go on sometimes in churches, I said few people are praying. Very few. I think sometimes we come to a place, brethren, where we think we can get along fine without God. Where should we pray? I think you know the answer, right? Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Why should we pray everywhere? Because danger is everywhere. Everywhere. We should pray when we're driving, walking, running. I sure wish I could pray, pray while I'm sleeping. I don't know if I do that or not. I wish I could pray while I'm sleeping. Whatever we do, we need to be praying, praying in our homes, praying in the workplace, praying in the place of worship. We need to pray everywhere. Why should we pray? Because we have a real enemy. Who's fighting back? We have a real enemy, and he is dead serious. He's serious about wrecking families. He's serious about wrecking homes. He's serious about wrecking congregations. He's serious about wrecking countries. We're serious. <laughs> the enemy is not going to lie down and let us cruise on easy street to heaven. He's not going to do it. <laughs> He's not. The street that you and I will find ourselves on is called warfare. A.K.A. Battleground. The prince of darkness is not happy. Listen, the prince of darkness is not happy that you have left him and joined his enemy. He's not going to let up. He's not. He wants you back on his team. Or he wants to keep you on his team. Either way. He will do whatever it takes to make it happen. And he doesn't play fair. We are dealing with an enemy, an evil, determinate, intelligent being. One of the greatest theologians that ever lived. He knows how to use the scripture to his advantage. Maybe I should say a world-class theologian. He has much, listen to this, he has much more experience in warfare than we do. Did you know that? He's been at it a long time. 
Paul is telling this church and us, you better be connected to the power supply called God if you are going to stand. We need power. We need protection. And hallelujah, God is so kind. He gives both. This battle and this battle, natural strength will not cut it. <sighs> this is not a battle where you kind of, like I, when I used to play football, we, you go in the field and they have the coin toss and you kind of say heads or tails and so forth and then you shake hands afterward. This is not that kind of battle. The enemy is not there to shake your hand. He's there to take you out. He's a real opponent. Never forget the fact that our opponent is still our opponent. He's out to do damage. We can't afford to put down our guards at any time. We ought to fight. We ought to fight. We ought to fight until our great captain, Jesus Christ, blows the trumpet. We ought to fight. We're on the battlefield. Not a playing field, but a battlefield. We are at war. We should pray because we need power and protection for the body of Christ. We ought to pray because the powers of darkness will be against us. Listen, all of our days. We have to pray. Because we are called to stand our ground, resist, stand, not budge, and fight together. We pray because we need God all the time. So what should we pray about? He already told us we need to pray always. What should we pray about? <clears throat> there are some things. We should pray about the health, strength, and spiritual growth of one another. The health, strength, and spiritual growth of one another. <clears throat> Listen carefully. We are to pray that we would grow in wisdom and knowledge of our great God, that our eyes would be enlightened to know the hope and calling and the riches of his glory in the saints. That's chapter 1. We are to pray that we would demonstrate that we are indeed God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to carry out good works. That's chapter 2. We ought to pray that we should be strengthened with might in the inner man by the Spirit. Chapter 3. We ought to pray that Jesus Christ would get glory in his churches throughout all ages. Chapter 3. We ought to pray that we will walk worthy of the calling in the spirit of meekness, demonstrating patience with one another in Christ-like love. Chapter 4. We ought to pray that we will not give one foothold to the devil. Chapter 4. We ought to pray that our speech would not be corrupt but edifying so that we would minister grace unto the hearers. Chapter 4, Paul is getting it all right from the book. We ought to pray. We will be followers of him because Jesus has loved us and gave himself for us. Chapter 5. We ought to pray that we would be filled with the Spirit as we sing to the Lord, making melody in our hearts. Chapter 5. 
We ought to pray for our marriages. There would be gospel reflecting marriages that husbands would sacrificially love their wives as Christ does the church and wives will respectfully submit to their husbands as the church does to Christ. Chapter 5. Some of the things we should pray for. Not only should the saints pray all the time, but there are various ways the saints can pray. What is meant by the term in verse 18, all prayer. Paul could be talking about different ways of praying. One can pray like Isaac walking out in the field. That's Genesis 24. One, one could pray like David sitting down, 2 Samuel chapter 7, on his throne or in the chair. One could pray like Solomon kneeling with his hands, stretch, arms stretched up. The position we are in is not the issue. It is the heart praying that's the issue. Paul could have in mind, as some suggest, the different kinds of prayer, such as adoration, thanksgiving, confession, and supplication. Prayers are sometimes silent, sometimes silent. Silent prayer as Hannah, praying, her lips moving, but no words coming out. Or as Nehemiah in chapter 2, chapter 1 and chapter 2, when Nehemiah, when the king says, uh, when the king says, uh, what, what's wrong? Why is your countenance sad? What, this is nothing but sadness, sorrow of heart. He said, then I prayed to the God of heaven. The king never heard him. It could be silent, silent prayer. Paul has already told them to pray always. Now he is saying, let all of your praying, watch this, be in the Spirit. We need the aid of the Spirit <clears throat> in our prayer. But we have to ask another question. What is meant by supplication? Because he says, praying always, all the time, with all prayer, could be various kinds of prayer, and supplication. What is meant by that? Th that word carries the sense of a petition, an entreaty, a plea. Believe me, we will need a plea in a spiritual battle. Sometimes it has to do with intercession. We'll see that in a little bit. But here we have prayer and supplication together. And then next we have perseverance and supplication. <clears throat> so the thought is this. That this is offered by a person who's in desperate need. Praying with all prayer and supplication. It's an entreatment. It's a plea. It's desperate. It is, it is a specific petition for a specific situation. It is an urgent request to meet an urgent need. Now, wouldn't you say, wouldn't I say, fighting the kingdom of darkness and standing against the world is an urgency? It's an urgent need. We need an urgent answer. We need urgent strength, if I may say it that way. We need help now. <clears throat> we need help from the living God. Always in this matter. <clears throat> so how are these things to be done? Paul says this. <clears throat> be done in the spirit, which I've already said. Why, but we have to ask, why would he mention the spirit along with prayer? Why would he even, why would he even do that? It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be surprising, right? <laughs> Throughout the letter, actually, he's mentioned the spirit in verse 13. He's a gift to us. In chapter 2, we have access to the Father by the Spirit. 
and chapter 2 also in 22, the habitation of God through the Spirit. In chapter 3, the mystery of the gospel was revealed by the Spirit. We are strengthened with the Spirit. In chapter 4, he said we need to maintain the unity, work hard, maintain the unity of the Spirit. In chapter 5, he says we need to be filled with the Spirit. Chapter 6, he said you need to take the sword of the Spirit. And now he's saying you need to pray in the Spirit. You need the Spirit. So do I. So what is praying in the Spirit? Here's my simple way of saying it. It is prayer aided by the Spirit according to the will of God. It is prayer aided by the Spirit according to the will of God. In other words, it's both divine and human. We pray and the Spirit helps. What a, what a combination. We pray and the Spirit helps. And it's because we need this help. We need it. Some of the things we want, we don't need. And some of the things we need, we don't want. Paul says it this way. Likewise, the Spirit also, listen, helpeth, because we need help. Our infirmities, our weakness. Why? For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. We don't even know what to pray for. We don't even really know what we need sometimes. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, listen, according to the will of God. So I said, why would the Spirit do that? Because we don't know what we need. <laughs> Sometimes, and he knows how to bring it into harmony with God. Listen, God knows what we need, when we need it, and how to get it to us. The will of God is what we need. What are some ways then we can pray in the Spirit? <clears throat> We can pray in the Spirit when we pray according to His will, as we've said. It is God's will for us to listen, to be strengthened with His might. That's His will. We can pray that. Praying according to the will of God. We, we can pray <clears throat> that the body be edified in love. That's His, that's his will. We can pray that we would be like Jesus, that's, that's his will. <clears throat> we could pray, it is God's will, if I say it this way, that we should give thanks unto God always for all things in the name of Christ because that's his will. We could pray that we would not provoke our children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord because that is his will. We could pray that we could draw strength from God because that's his will. We can even pray that we pray always because that's his will. And we can pray that we would not be conformed to this world, but be transformed in the renewing of our minds because that is his will. How we pray in the Spirit. And this is just some ways. Well, not only does the saints need to pray all the time, <clears throat> not only do saints have various ways to pray, but saints need to pray with perseverance. To praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all 
perseverance. You have to pray for perseverance. Why? Why would he even say this? That perseverance stands for being on God, be ready, being on watch. That's the word watching. Being on God, being ready, being alert, being on watch. If you got a real enemy, you want to be alert. You want to be ready. You ought to be watching. The enemy, as I said again, I'll say it again. I said before, I'll say it again. The enemy that the church's, church faces is real. <laughs> Do you believe the enemy is real? Paul said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. And I know that's hard for us to understand because all we see is flesh and blood. He said, the enemy is real. This is not some make-believe character, red suit, pointy tail on a pitchfork. This is no make-believe character. We have to see that. We got to believe it. He's real. He'll destroy things. And he does it all the time. And sometimes we help him. I don't understand it. We have to be on guard against this foe. Peter said, not only did Paul say, Peter said, you better be sober, be vigilant, give strict attention. You need to be on alert. Why, Peter? Because your adversary, the devil, is roaring, going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Not shake hands with. Devour. The Lord asked Satan, where have you, where have you been? Oh, I've been <laughs> to and fro, uptown, downtown, and across town. <laughs> you got a real enemy. Seeking whom he may devour, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Peter says this way, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We have to be on our guard because the enemy is real. We need full power. We need full protection because we have a serious battle on our hands. And I would venture to say we don't take it seriously. We don't. <sighs> Paul said, watching, be alert. He says also, Watching thereunto with all perseverance. The word perseverance means <clears throat> with persistence. See, you need to keep going. You need to keep going in spite of difficulties. It's easy to quit, isn't it? <laughs> let's, be, let's be honest. It's easy to quit. I said this to my wife. I said, sweetheart, it's easier to quit than to keep going. Paul said, no, we, you have to have perseverance. You have to have persistence. You need to keep going in spite of difficulty. Jesus said to his disciples that men shall, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. We have to stay at it. So what are some ways to persevere? <clears throat> we must pray Believingly. <laughs> we must pray believingly. To pray without believing, listen, is atheistic. Atheistic. We must pray believingly, believing God is able to do exceeding abundantly about all that we ask or think. According to his power. We have to pray believingly. Not only so, we persevere another way. We need to pray expectantly. Not only believingly, expectantly. To pray, listen, to the Lord and not expect anything from him is hypocrisy. We ought to pray expecting from God. Another way, not only believingly, expectantly, 
but we persevere by waiting for our answer patiently. God rarely, listen, God rarely answers prayer the way we pray them. Are you with me? <laughs> he rarely gives it to you exactly how you pray it. Rare. It's rare. Moses, I'll give you an example. I've said this before. Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 3, Lord, let me go over and see the land. And God, just as a loving father, doesn't give him any explanation there. He did explain prior to, but Moses already knew what God had said. He said, let me go over and see the good land. We're close. Let me go over and see it. God said, don't talk to me anymore about this. What? <laughs> That's right. God, don't talk to me anymore about this. You can go up to the mountain, and you can look to the north, south, east, and west. All of this land I'm going to give to the children of Israel, but you're not going. But I want you to notice something in that. Moses prayed that he would go over and see the land. God is so merciful and gracious, God lets him go up to the mountain to see the land, but not over. He still answered a prayer, he just didn't answer it the way Moses prayed it. And he rarely does. The same thing with Paul. I mentioned it on Sunday, I believe. Second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said, I prayed three times, three times. I've been on the battlefield for Jesus, and I asked Jesus three times, would you take it away from me? Three times, and Jesus said, grace is what you need. That was, was that what Paul was praying for? <laughs> she said, I got something for you. It's called my strength and your weakness. That's what you need. He knows exactly what we need. He didn't answer it to co according to how Paul prayed it. But he did answer. It's rare. It's rare that God answers the way we pray. The psalmist said, I waited patiently on the Lord for the Lord. Listen, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my going. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. We need to pray believingly, expectantly. We need to wait on God patiently. We also persevere when we rest, listen, when we rest contently, contently in the answer that God gives. Contently. Are you content on the answers that God gives? How about if he gives you a no? You content with that? Content. For us to go into this battle, with the enemies, I say enemies because we got the world too. For us to go into the battle, for us to battle the world, our own flesh, and the devil without praying is idolatry. Idolatry. Well, can I press on just a little further? The saints need to pray always. Saints need to pray in various ways. Saints need to pray persevering, but saints need to pray for saints. That's what, that's what he said in the text. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. For all saints. Why would he even say something like this? Why would he have to say this? This should be a given, right? Why, why, would, he, why would he have to say it? <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe Paul is saying it because we are so selfish in our prayers. Maybe that's why. We only think about number one. Maybe that's the reason why he's saying pray for all saints. <sighs> help us, help us, help us. Maybe, maybe he's, he's, he's saying this. Because we at times may give 
very little thought to the lives of others. Maybe that's why. It's a maybe. Maybe, maybe he's maybe he's saying pray for the saints because because there's gossip going on among the saints. Maybe, maybe that's why. Maybe he's saying pray for them because guess what? Normally, normally you want gossip about a person you're praying for. <laughs> maybe that's why. Maybe there's a problem with forgiveness. And that's why he's saying, pray for the saints. He speaks of forgiveness in chapter 4. You need to forgive like Christ forgave. Maybe that's why. I can tell you right now, if a person is not on your forgiven list, they are not on your prayer list. We should be on one another's prayer list, not on one another's hit list. Maybe he's saying pray for, pray for the saints because they are living in a loose society. You need to be praying for the saints. The Lord keep them and pray for the saints. Maybe, maybe he's saying pray for the saints because there's a, t- a tendency just to pray for a selective few. Maybe that's why. Our own click. Maybe that's it. Maybe he's saying pray for the saints because there's tension between children and parents. Chapter 6. Maybe that's why. Could it be children who won't listen and parents who are brutal? Could be. Maybe, Maybe the families are just in disarray. Maybe that's why he said pray for the saints. And I think it's this, because if we have families with trouble, <laughs> you got churches with trouble. Guaranteed. Churches are made up of families. <clears throat> Maybe that's why he's saying pray. I don't know what the reason is, but the bottom line is this. Paul is saying pray For the saints, that's what he's saying. Not only should you pray for the saints, saints praying for saints. I have a, oh, man, final thing. I think that's final. Well, I have something else. Not only should we pray for each other. Maybe I should put it a different way. Not only should the preacher pray, but the preacher also need to be prayed for. Paul tells the saints, pray for the preacher, (laughs) pray for the pastor. It's right there in your Bible. Look at verse 19. He said, after he says all this about praying, he said, and for me, don't forget about me. (laughs) Don't forget about me. Paul requests that the preacher should have a word to preach. That's what he said. Don't forget about me. Pray pray for me that utterance may be given unto me. I need a word. I need a word. It's a real battle and I need a word. Pray for me. Paul said, remember, if I could put it in my own words, remember the preacher. Not only do I need a word, look at verse 19. He says, also, I need boldness. Pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly. I need boldness. Paul asking for boldness? Oh, yes, he needs it. He does not pray as he's sitting in a jail, maybe in Rome. He he does not pray to be set free, but Paul is praying to be a bold witness for Jesus Christ. Make me a bold witness. He realized that he's going to proclaim 
the word, if he's going to proclaim that word, he needs boldness. If he's, not, he's going to proclaim that word in a pagan society, and listen, our society isn't much different. If we are going to proclaim that word, it's going to take some boldness. Biblical backbone. He will have to speak the word with confidence and courage fearlessly. Why would he have to do that? Because the fear of man bringeth a snare. He needs boldness. God's preachers need boldness, especially in this day and age. Paul also said something else. He says, utterance, I need a word that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, that the gospel would be declared. We've already seen some of this. Just let me trace some of this out. God has come down to us in this glorious person in Jesus Christ. He's come down to us in order to wash us clean from our sin, redeem us in the blood of Jesus Christ. He's even sent his spirit to make us alive so that we would no longer walk in darkness, but in the light of the love of Almighty God. We would not live after the cravings of our flesh and the lust of our minds and remain children of wrath. I say he's raised us. He's placed us in Jesus Christ. We are secure. He's given us faith in the gift of the Spirit so we would not be aliens and strangers. And I used to be asked back if I believe in aliens. I say, yes, I do called unsaved folks, aliens, strangers, afar off. Jesus Christ himself has washed us. He has made peace with God through the cross work and reconciled us to God through his crucified body on the cross. But now adopted, part of God's family, God's dwelling place. Paul is saying, I need to declare that message, and I'm going to need some boldness. He knows that the gospel is spiritual water for thirsty soul and bread for the hungry soul. The gospel brings peace to the troubled soul. He knows that there's forgiveness for any sinner who comes to Jesus Christ by faith. He knows that God sent his son made of a woman to redeem them, to purchase them. I love the word. Brother Jeff talked about it a few weeks ago, but let me go a little further. Not only purchased out of the slave market of sin, it's purchased to make one's own, purchased to set free, and purchased to take home. Redeem. He knows that Christ came into the world to rescue sinners. Even the chief. He said, I want to declare that message. That message, the real emancipation proclamation. That message of liberation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So pray for the preacher. Why? Because the preacher needs boldness because it's easy to preach what people want to hear. It's easy to do it. He needs some gospel grit to preach what needs to be here and not what people want to hear. He needs some grit. <clears throat> he needs to be prayed for because it's easy to avoid the hard teachings of the word. He needs boldness. He needs prayer. <clears throat> it's easy to preach those things that are more satisfying and smooth for the flesh. It's easy to do. Those things that touch sensitive areas, 
those things that he knows will offend, those things that call us to do more and to be more and to live more for Jesus Christ, he cannot avoid. He needs prayer. He needs prayer. <sighs> Our time's gone. Let me just say this. The preacher needs prayer because it's easy to quit the ministry. He needs prayer. It's easy to say, I'm done. Why am I doing this anyways? Moses says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeyings according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up? out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. Watch this. Who shall give flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all, the people are saying, beside this manna before our eyes. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly kindled. Moses also was displeased in the Lord, and Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all his people upon me. Have I conceived all his people? Have I forgotten them, begotten them, that thou shouldest say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the suckling child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because it is too heavy for me. I hope you hear the burden. How did he say it? That's what he said. If you're going to deal with me this way, kill me. I'm done with ministry. Pray for the preacher. It's easy to quit. Keep going. I'll just. Let me just say this and we're done. Pray for the preacher because the word helps to prepare us for eternity. Pray for the preacher. The Lord knows this battle is strong. This battle is serious. And if we are going to gain victory in this battle, Looking to the victorious one, Jesus Christ, we must, we must be a praying people. Must be. If not, we will not stand. <clears throat> there are many, I should, I should say some, there are some congregations that are no longer congregations, if I could say it like that. Maybe I say were congregations. Because the enemy came in, dropped that grenade, and left. Paul is saying to this church, arm in arm and stand against the wiles of the wicked one, and your greatest weapon is prayer. Use it. Use it. May God help us to do so for his glory. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again for Christ the King. Thank you that he's kind and generous to us. But Father, we have a real battle before us. Lord, help us. Help us in this battle, we pray. We need your strength. 
Help us not to rely on the arm of flesh. It will indeed fail us. But, Father, help us to rely on thee, the true and living God, and on the power of your spirit, sanctifying mercies, Lord, to walk arm in arm and to stand firm wearing the whole armor. Bless us indeed, we pray. Give us safe passage home now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Our benediction, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God be with you till we meet again.